Hello, my name is Nirali Patel and I am the service director for Woman is Hero. I am honored to introduce our next speaker, a professor of English at Arizona State University. Melissa Pritchard is a journalist, essayist, novelist, and short story writer, author of seven published books and the biography of Virginia G. Piper. Melissa's ninth book, a novel, will be published in next January. She has received numerous national and international awards and fellowships for her writing, as well as for her humanitarian efforts. Most recently, she was the recipient of one of ASU's highest honors for faculty, the Founders Day Award. Her in-depth journalism piece, Still God Helps You, Memories of a Former Sudanese Child Slave, will be published this summer by the Wilson Quarterly for the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Melissa Pritchard. I'm honored to be here, and I thank all the people involved in this wonderful conference. We have not even to risk the, journey, the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero's path, and where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god. And where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outward, we will come to the center of our own existence. And where we had thought to be alone, we will be with all the world. Joseph Campbell. This is a photograph of a young woman I was honored to know too briefly, Air Force Senior Airman Ashton Goodman. She will always be a hero to me, and this afternoon, I want to invite you on a journey of heroes. The women of the long war in Afghanistan. Rarely acknowledged, unheralded, they are the hidden half of the 11-year war. American military women who once worked peacefully without weapons on provincial reconstruction teams. And today's Afghan women and girls who face the imminent challenge of a post-war Afghanistan. I invite you into the labyrinth of this hidden war, following the thread of a brave faith in the power of education and the power of the written and spoken word to liberate women from the old tyrannies of illiteracy, poverty, and violence. A brief history, bear with me, it's brief, of provincial reconstruction teams. In 2002, provincial reconstruction teams made up of combined American military, civilian, and NATO forces were established in 25 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. By 2009, there were 27 provincial reconstruction teams, or PRTs as they're called, in, oper in operation. Their objective was to restore rule of governance to the Afghan people by peacefully initiating sustainable projects in agriculture, medicine, and education, and engineering. In Panjshir province, 120 miles northwest of Kabul, in the foothills of the Hindu Kush Mountains, Forward Operating Base Lion, or FOB Lion, was the smallest but most successful of these PRTs. Home to 70 people, a combination of United States military personnel, federal civilians, civilian interpreters, Mujahideen guards, and facilities staff, Team Lion initiated and maintained do dozens of successful projects in each of their, their provinces in seven districts, Anaba, Shutal, Kenj, Dara, Ruka, Paryan, and Bazarak. Military women were particularly valued in this work since they could communicate and work directly with Afghan women in ways that the men, because of cultural prohibitions, absolutely could not. Even so, only five of Team Lion's 70 members were American, Air Force and Army women. In January 2009, 
I flew from Delhi, India to Afghanistan to meet them. The Medical Clinic in Anaba. It is Air Force Major Valerie Trump's mission this morning. Four military women, a female interpreter, and myself follow her down a footpath to an old clinic in Anaba. We pass a cemetery where half a dozen flags of green cloth flutter from wooden poles. The graves of martyrs, someone says. And then we head inside the small mud-walled clinic. The rooms are tiny, unheated, and spartan. One wall displays a variety of contraceptives, condoms, pills, and IUD devices, scotch taped to a white poster board, each one labeled in Dari. 42-year-old Major Trump, with a pageant-perfect smile, says Shalama to a pair of tired-looking male doctors in wilted white medical coats. And after a brief conversation about the clinic's water sanitation unit, whether it even works or not, we take leave of the two men and crowd into a room we are told is the birthing room. Major Trump introduces herself to the attending midwife, a slight, tense-seeming woman wearing a white doctor's coat and a bright orange hijab, or traditional headscarf. She tells us she used to hitchhike to the clinic and back from her home in Capiza province, more than five hours away. Now she lives in the clinic, constantly available to the women from nearby villages who may need her. This helps them to trust her, she says. The young midwife's family is angry with her for this, for putting her reputation as a single woman at risk. And her brother is equally angry because he's forced to live in the clinic with her as her protector. It's freezing at night. There is no firewood, no heat of any kind. Most nights, she tells us, she sits upright in a chair, too cold to sleep. The birthing room has only one small, unlit propane stove for heat. Drawing aside a partition curtain, a piece of patterned bed sheeting on a thin rope, she shows us a birthing gurney, its black vinyl surface ripped in several places. Next, she picks up a tin device, a funnel used to monitor the baby's heartbeat. And she tells us that this is the only piece of birthing equipment the clinic has. As we continue to talk with her, our and, and via our interpreter, she responds to a knock at the door and three women, each wearing a blue burqa, they file in wordlessly and sit together on a wooden window ledge. Within moments, one woman, followed by the others, rolls her veil back from her face with a practiced and impatient gesture. All three are dark-haired and brown-eyed, two might be in their thirties, and the youngest bears scars along her cheeks from leishmaniasis, a common skin disease, disfiguring, and caused by sand flies. All three women have handsome, strong-featured faces, sharpened and defined by hardship. The youngest, perhaps in her early 20s, has come to see the midwife because her husband wants a second child and she's unable to conceive. Related by marriage, all these women live in the same mud and straw compound with other family members. Their manner is reserved and they answer questions first from the midwife, then from me. And when they answer these questions, they're hesitant, and they're less shy than extremely guarded. Then there's a second knock at the door, and a fourth woman makes her way in, sits down with a deft movement, rolls the blue veil back from her face. This woman looks exhausted and older, perhaps in her mid-40s. Nine months pregnant, with five children. She has walked a long distance alone along icy paths through deep drifts of snow. And beneath the hem of her burqa, I see her floral patterned burgundy dress made of some thin polyester-like material, how it falls to the tops of her simple worn black shoes. I'm wearing a hijab, military issue winter underwear, a heavy fleece jacket, insulated socks and boots, jeans, and I'm still shivering in the unheated room. As the midwife talks with the older woman, one of the female soldiers quietly relates a story she recently heard about an Afghan woman with no female relatives, who when it came time for her to give birth, was locked in a room by her husband. The woman labored alone with no medication, no food or water, and delivered the baby by herself. The majority of Afghan women give birth at home, though most do have, uh, have women relatives and sometimes a midwife to assist them. When I ask these four women, they answer emphatically that they would absolutely prefer to give birth in a clean clinic with medical assistance. 
And before we leave, I ask the midwife what she most needs, what she would want if she could ask for and have anything. She answers passionately and at length about all that she wishes she could have to help these women. Her frustration at the lack of basic necessities is as great as her courage in defying her family's censure. She has no assistant and no equipment other than a tin funnel and a broken gurney. Afghanistan today is probably the worst place on earth to be born. In a country with the second highest infant mortality rate in the world, second only to Sierra Leone, one fourth of Afghan children die before ever reaching their fifth birthday. 60% of Afghanistan's children are chronically malnourished with consequent developmental difficulties. Afghan women suffer the highest maternal mortality rate in the world, and the average Afghan woman has a life expectancy of less than 44 years. Here is Roya. Born in Kabul, she grew up during the Taliban years, and she wants to continue her education and get a master's degree, though she dreams, too, of being a poet. I see from the windows of my burqa, but I do not see. Where is the sky? The world is not so big for me. There is no world. I live in the prison under my burqa, no permission to breathe the air. I am a woman, here, here, here. Men are jobless, with nothing good to do. They discovered the burqa for me. There is so much under my burqa. It is the cemetery of my identity, a woman's grave, prison of the air, enemy of my personality. I love my hijab. I love my Allah. I love my Islam. But the burqa is not the hijab. And if it is, why don't I wear it when I pray? I ask you, God. I ask you, God. The Polish Girls' School. It's mid-January and my roommate, Air Force Major Kimberly Garbett, still keeps a tiny Christmas tree in her room, its winking jewel-colored lights looping around the artificial tree, across the military issue desk, and up an otherwise bare wall. Beside it are a stack of books and a care package she hasn't had time to open yet. I've been assigned to the bottom half of the metal bunk across from her, and as we travel out on missions together, I discover that Major Garbett has an unnerving but mostly helpful habit of sidling up to me and murmuring diplomatic suggestions in my ear. On the day we visit a Polish NGO built girls high school, she suggests as we stand in a freezing unlit schoolroom facing a semicircle of silent, diffident girls in deep cowled white hijabs, that I ask the male principal of the school for permission to ask the girls a few questions, perhaps take photos. Listening to Major Garbett, I watch another few member of our mission team, Tech Sergeant Don Allison Hess, reach inside one of the boxes of school supplies we've brought to remove a Sunday parade magazine with a provocative photo of Marilyn Monroe on its cover, crumpling it up before the Muslim girls can see what image their new pencils were wrapped in. These supplies, paper, pen, pencils, crayons, binders, were a donation from an American church group, and before we carried the half dozen cartons into the school, each box had been opened and sorted through for any sign of Christian propaganda since technically any attempt to convert Muslims to Christianity is punishable by beheading. Somehow, Marilyn had escaped notice until now when she's crunched and, and crushed into an innocuous invisibility among other discarded wrappings. The principal has reluctantly permitted me to ask his students a few questions, though I am not allowed to take photographs. The girls, who look to be between 13 and 17, are unsettlingly deferential ducking their heads, covering their faces when spoken to, and silent, until our interpreter introduces me as an American journalist, who wonders if the girls have any questions. Two instantly eager raise their hands. Are you married? No. Do you have children? Yes. Two daughters. Oh, from a Muslim perspective, I realize my answer must seem to conflict blasphemously. Perhaps they'll conclude I'm a widow. To deflect other potentially embarrassing questions, I jump into talking about fiction writing, the cultural and personal importance of telling one's story. I describe the writing classes I teach back home. We want you to stay and teach us, they say. How long will you be in Panjshir? Can you stay? In that moment, looking at their shy, eager, and beautiful faces, I'm tempted to change the course of my life. 
Instead, I tell them I must leave for Kabul the next morning, and then I ask what they would like to be one day. What are their goals and their dreams? A doctor, says one girl. A writer offers another. A journalist like you, says a third. And the room turns quiet with dreams. In Afghanistan, the education crisis can only be called dire. In a country where half the population is under the age of 18, 25% of all children 14 and under work as child laborers. Less than half of children attend school or even have access to school. For girls, the situation is far, far worse. In rural regions, up to 92% of Afghan girls will never attend school. In 2009, the United Nations recorded the highest number of attacks against education in the world took place in Afghanistan. These attacks mainly targeted girls' schools. The teachers and students at those schools the teachers and students at those schools were attacked. An Afghan girl's literacy is hardly of any value when between 60 to 80 percent of all marriages involve girls or children between the ages of 7 and 16 forced into arranged marriages, often to settle disputes and to pay off debts. Again, according to recent United Nations statistics, over 87 percent of Afghan women, almost 90 percent, experience domestic violence and abuse. This makes Afghanistan not only the worst place on earth to be born, but one of the most dangerous places on earth to be a female. Dr. Serena Yakubi, founder and executive director of the Afghan Institute of Learning in Kabul, runs health clinics and schools for women and children in Afghanistan. She says this, education is the key issue for overcoming poverty, for overcoming war. If people are educated, then women will not be abused or tortured. They will also stand and they will say, my child should not be married so young. I live in fear, says one Afghan woman who remains anonymous for security reasons, because I married the man of my choice instead of my cousin. When a knock comes at the door, my husband and I don't dare answer, and when we leave the house, we can only hope that we will return in the evening. Covering my face with a black veil, avoiding contact with my friends, hiding myself in public, makes me feel alone and mad. I'm 50 years older inside than I am on the calendar and so very tired of the war in my life. I am proud of my strength and that I stood up against everything, but still I am destroyed inside. My soul is hardened. My husband reads stories of famous men to me at night and recalls my energy. I'm waiting for the day when I can get my, my master's degree and open a school and teach our people to respect human rights so that the next, 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 and next generations won't have our destiny. Another woman says, I told my mom, please give me a chance. I don't like this man. I can't marry him. If you want to sell me, I'm ready to buy myself. I'm like a piece of cloth. I cost little. Who will buy me? Generosity means poverty. On a snowy school ground as the twilight sky deepens first into cobalt blue, then starless black, Army Sergeant Amanda Cutler's planned mission in inter International Security Assistance, or ISAF aid drop, goes terribly wrong. Boxes of loose black tea, white cloth sacks of flour, nested bowls, nested aluminum bowls, small prayer rugs, aprons, shawls, blankets, gloves, and mittens are snatched, wrestled, and literally torn from our hands by hundreds of desperate Afghan women, as dozens of children, wretchedly dressed and shivering, dive into the supplies, outwitting us as we struggle with bare hands in the darkness to tear open heavily taped cardboard boxes and plastic wrapped bales of supplies. Children rip open the bags around my feet with small nimble fingers dart off with gloves, mittens, shawls. Hundreds of the poorest women from this part of Panjshir province, shrouded in burqas, form a restless sea of blue iridescence pressing against me. I cannot see their faces, only the eerie glisten of their eyes pleading from behind the grill, the grill or jila of their veils. Their bare hands beg, their piteous voices beseech in Dari, a language I do not understand. Pressed by the weight of so many bodies against the school's concrete wall, I fight off panic, struggle to breathe, even as a large bowl grazes the side of my head. In less than an hour, everything is gone. Only a few children still scuffle through a debris of tape and plastic and string at my feet. What happened to 24-year-old Sergeant Cutler's logistics 
her well-intentioned plans. All it took was a surprise winter storm, an early morning phone call from a member of Panchir's provincial council, saying the drop was postponed because of the severity of the storm. The women wouldn't be able to walk from their villages to the school, but the women did walk, and a second phone call, much later in the day, informed Sergeant Cutler that over 400 women with children were crowded into the unheated entrance of a school waiting. They'd been there eight hours with no heat, no food or water. After a frenzied rush at FOB Lion to get supplies reloaded onto our truck, I accompanied the military women to the school. Sergeant Cutler still hoping to successfully implement the fair distribution plan she had worked so hard for. She stands in the school foyer facing an ocean of women in thin faded burqas offering apologies for the delay and then launches into a prepared speech that no longer seems to match the occasion. The women miserably huddled with their children in the icy room try to understand as they're instructed to file outside, stand in orderly rows, and wait patiently so that each woman can be handed her equal portion of goods. But the moment Sergeant Cutler, the other four military women, and I step outside to take our assigned distribution points along the school portico, the women, cold, hungry, exhausted, and angry, facing hours of walking in darkness with small children back to their remote villages, surge from the building and begin helping themselves, their instinct for survival far stronger than Sergeant Cutler's orderly plan. Supplies dwindle swiftly. And the women fight over a precious box of black tea or a bowl to mix their food in or a prayer rug or a sack of flour. And then when everything's gone, they melt out of the schoolyard gates with their children and vanish into the night. A few stagger under the weight of all they have managed to seize. Others, especially the elderly, are empty-handed. In silence, we pick up crushed boxes, tape, and plastic. Later that night, Major Trump appears beside me at the sink in the women's bathroom wearing her pajamas and holding her toothbrush. She's tired and upset. They should turn, turn aid supplies over to Afghan women on the provincial council next time. Let those women decide who gets what. If the whole point of military women distributing aid to Afghan women was to put an American face on generosity, then today, she says, that point has just been dismally lost. Unable to sleep, I keep imagining these women, mothers, grandmothers, widows in burqas, the pale blue color of gas flame, walking up faint trails into the mountains, back to their mud and straw homes, heated only by fires of twigs and animal dung. I picture their worn slippers darkened and wet with snow, and imagine the children, some wearing new mittens, or perhaps only one, the other lost somewhere. I picture the weak, the elderly, and most unfortunate of all, the ever-growing number of war widows falling behind, empty-handed. To be an Afghan child today is grim enough destiny. But for girls and women, it's a nightmare reflected in rising epidemics of opium addiction and suicide by self-immolation. In a country that's been continuously at war internally and externally for over 30 years, Though children continue to be born, it is safe to say childhood no longer exists. And to be born an Afghan girl means, for most, a fate of illiteracy, forced marriage, physical abuse, little if any health or prenatal care, hunger, a life of near enslavement that lasts perhaps 40 years. Living in a village four hours south of Kabul, this young woman writes anonymously that by day in her village, the men pretend to support the government, the U.S. and NATO soldiers, but by night, they're all Taliban. You may say you want to help me, but I'm living in a situation where you cannot help me. All of my province is full of Talibs. Two days ago, my, my brothers were killed because the Taliban said they worked with the government. One had two children, and the other left a pregnant wife. No one can talk here, and all men wear beards. And the weddings are silent because no one can play music. I go to my office and I love to go to work every day, but when the security is bad, Dad insults me and tells me not to go. Mom hates my job, only my brother supports my working. But he's not with us, my final brother. The Taliban warned him not to come here anymore, so when he does, it's in the middle of the dark night and it is hard. You say you want to help me, but I tell you, you cannot help me. I come to Kabul to use the internet, but my family doesn't like me to come to Kabul. I'd love to go to college, but my family doesn't agree. 
I see the cows can go out, but I'm a girl and cannot go out. If I go, Talibs will kill me, and no one will even ask why. Senior Airman Ashton Goodman. Heading back to forward operating base Lyon after visiting a remote medical clinic in the district of Shudal, our two-vehicle convoy of military women and Mujahideen guards is suddenly caught in a fierce blizzard. Navigating the dirt road its slick hairpin descent, heavy snow falling and sticking faster than the windshield wipers can clear the glass, Senior Airman Goodman, jaw clenched, half humming, half singing, the ants come marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah manages to keep the land cruiser from sliding off the road and plunging into a rocky ravine. Concerned about the less experienced driver behind her, he's got a wife and a new baby at home. She signals that she's stopping, breaks, and then jumps out to help three elderly men in traditional Afghan dress, stranded beside a rust-eaten sedan that snows tight and sideways into an ochre cleft of the mountainside. Within minutes, she frees their car, and after politely thanking her, the men climb back into their ancient vehicle and proceed down the sinuous road, while Goodman, as she prefers to be called, follows right behind. On another day, we stop for lunch at the one restaurant in Panjshir, a pale green threadbare cafe along the riverside, serving typical Afghan fare, kebabs, pilau, and a kind of naan, or naan, bread, I'd never seen before. The pieces are huge and snowshoe-shaped. Goodman grins as she tears into hers. I love this stuff, she says at the end of our meal, and the rest of us hand over all of our extra naan, which she cheerfully wraps in her hijab. <clears throat> Outside the restaurant, Goodman leapfrogs across rocks into the middle of the broad, taupe-colored Panshir River, mugging and clowning and posing for photos. Driving us back to the base, she hoots with delight whenever we pass a scruffy scatter of red hens pecking along the roadside or huddled listless in a dirt yard. Particularly crazy about birds, she lavishes an almost impish affection on all shunned creatures, slugs, frogs, mice, and unabashedly she mothers dogs, birds, babies of all kinds, anything innocent and sweetly alive. It isn't hard to imagine what a wonderful mother she would make. When I ask about her boyfriend, she says his name is David, David Flint, and that he's in the army fighting somewhere in Afghanistan. Like her, he's from Indianapolis, and she can't wait to get home so they can raise a bunch of chickens, because they both like them so much. She doesn't say any more about David after that, reluctant, perhaps, to jinx her future happiness. Even when serious and quiet, Goodman blazes with an uncommon energy. On the day before I leave Panjshir, she meets me in the base's chilly community room for our scheduled interview, minus weapons with her golden hair pulled back into a shiny clubbed ponytail. She looks shockingly young, yet precociously mature, self-effacing, yet eager for the novelty of being interviewed. She tells me she's studying biology, plans to be a veterinarian, and is an amateur photographer and aspiring author, writing her little stories, as she calls them, to relieve stress. She started Rosetta Stone Spanish lessons and confesses to missing luxurious bubble baths and her pet green parrot, Jake, Jake and Bacon, back in Indianapolis. Ashley has a tattoo on her left forearm. Studium nunquam intereo, spirit never dies. As she answers questions about her family's military history, her own decision to join the Air Force, she tells me her dream of being a fighter pilot, her disappointment at being one inch under the minimum five foot four inch height requirement. And then she shyly admits another dream, to be a published writer one day. As she talks, I watch her surface toughness fall away. I see that she's no different from my own daughters, from the young women who are my university students. Like them, she too is eager to create a life that matters. That night, Ashton sits close beside me in the chow hall, examining every photograph on my digital camera, images from recent trips to India, Scotland, England, France, Italy. As she asks me about the people and places in the photographs, she confesses her desire to travel the world, to see it all, and the frank hope and hunger on her thoughtful, unmarked face moves me. Ashton, you're so young, you still have lots of time. Handing the camera back to me, she simply says, I want to go to Africa. It's April now, springtime. I'm home, working, and Ashton emails me photographs she's taken. An Afghan mother holding her newborn daughter, a puppy the soldiers had adopted, a pale downy cluster of baby chicks and panoramic views of the richly green, lush Panjshir Valley. 
In her interview, she had talked about her time in Iraq as a driver for line haul convoys routing supplies on IED-infested roads. One of our guys was killed by a mine, and I was the first to know, she told me. I wasn't supposed to tell anyone, so I was just walking around with this knowledge. Later, after people were informed, I became one of the comforters. Afterwards, it was really hard. It was bad. We'd have to drive every day on the same road where it happened and see the bomb hole, the trail of his blood. I went through a period then of being really shaken up, stressed out, shaking, scared. Then I knew it was about fate, God, coincidence. When it was my time, it was my time. And after that, I wasn't scared. The most surprising thing about this mission in Panjshir, she told me, was how peaceful it was. She didn't have to be as guarded or as afraid. It's unlikely, she said, that anyone here has a bomb strapped to his chest. On May 26, 2009, Senior Airman Ashton Goodman died on a road outside Bagram Airfield of wounds sustained from an improvised explosive device. She was 21 years old. An anonymous female Afghan journalist writes, the road from southeastern Afghanistan to Kabul is no longer safe. Along the way, Talibs will suddenly appear from nowhere and stop cars. They check all the passengers and ask for, for their ID cards. They want to know who's traveling. They check to see if anybody in the car works for the government, or if anybody has a mobile phone. They check to see if that phone has a camera, and if it does, they kill them. The the, if, the, if the phone has a song, they kill the person too. I feel unsafe when I carry my notebook. It's my writing notebook, and it has English and diary notes and drafts of my work. I hide my notebook under my burqa. If they catch me with it or find out I have it, then for sure I'll be killed. And my fault will be writing. To be honest, I'm not always hopeful for the future of my country. Afghan Women's Writing Project. In the months before she died, Ashton Goodman was assigned to Women's Affairs, acting as a liaison between the Provincial Reconstruction Team and the Afghan women in Panjshir province. She attended women's weekly council meetings, or shuras, and became deeply impressed by the women's intelligence, resilience, and bravery. It infuriates me, she said, that women here are treated as second-class citizens. I'd like to see a woman with her own shop, a woman doctor. I know it will take generations because they need infrastructure here, schools and clean water and clean places to slaughter animals rather than by the side of the road. I'd really like to come back here in 20 years and show my kids how we helped. I'm fighting a different battle now, she said, not with weapons, but with words. A few days before her death, around the time that this photograph was taken, her first and her only published article appeared on an Air Force media site. Ashton requested permission to stay on in Panjshir province. She wanted to continue her work with Afghan women, she told her commanding officer, and she felt as if finally she was making a difference. Late in June 2010, two months after my feature story, Finding Ashton, a Soldier's Story, appeared in Oh! the Oprah Winfrey Magazine's 10th anniversary issue, and one week after what would have been Ashton's 22nd birthday, I launched the Ashton Goodman Fund in honor of Ashton and in support of the Afghan Women's Writing Project. The writers whose voices you have been hearing this afternoon are all members of that project. Masha Hamilton, journalist and author of four novels, is the founder of two world literacy projects, the Camel Book Drive in 2007 in Kenya and the Afghan Women's Writing Project, or AWWP, in 2009. The mission of the Afghan Women's Writing Project is to nurture and support the voices of the women of Afghanistan. The AWWP believes that having the freedom to tell one's story is a human right. And today, American women writers actively mentor close to 100 Afghan women writers. And the result has been an extraordinary outpouring of poetry, essays, and stories published on both the AWWP website and in the monthly online newsletter. To date, Thousands of dollars have been raised by the Ashton Goodman Fund and other donations, mostly in small amounts, sometimes $10, $5, uh, On these, these donations so often are accompanied by letters from men and women who've been moved by Ashton Goodman's story, by the Af Afghan Women's Writing Project, people who want to help Afghan women and girls achieve literacy. 
Thanks to these many donations, we've been able to open our first women's safe writing house in one of Kabul's neighbor safer neighborhoods. A guard lives on the premises, and in the comfortably furnished apartment, women writers gather to share one another's writing, to freely use the internet, and to choose books from the small library we're gradually building for them. With the Goodman Fund, we've also purchased additional laptops for writers, paid internet fees, and given internet sticks to those women in rural areas who cannot safely or easily travel to Kabul. Women like Tabasong, who, hides her, who hid her laptop under animal feed bags and in the kitchen woodpile, and lived in constant fear of being caught by her family and punished for her writing. Here is Roya. I took my pen to write, and at first I was afraid what to write, what about? But this was a project to write about everything, and so I took the pen. I didn't write from outside my heart. I began to write about whatever was in my heart. The writing project gave me a voice. The project gave me courage to appear as a woman, to tell about my life, to share my pains and experiences. I wonder how big the change in my destiny is because of your work and this project. Who would trust an online class, a writing project, to change a destiny and a faith? Afghan Women's Writing Project gave me the power to feel I'm not only a woman, it gave me a title, an Afghan woman writer. I took the pen and I wrote and everything changed. I learned that if I stand, everyone will stand. Other women in my country will stand. In June 2010, Masha Hamilton received the Women's National Book Association Award for the Afghan Women's Writing Project. And on September 20th, 2010, the New York State Division of Human Rights recognized the AWWP with an award for significant contributions to human rights. Recently, the Fetzer Institute awarded a large grant to the Afghan Women's Writing Project, sponsoring a writing project focused on love and forgiveness. Online news sites, blogs, and print sources continually publish articles about the Afghan Women's Writing Project. The latest is a wonderful story in the Wilson Quarterly uh, about three Afghan women telling their stories. Dramatic readings of the women's writings have been staged in theaters in Los Angeles, New York, and Washington, D.C. Nationwide, smaller groups gather in living rooms and host readings and fundraisers for their communities. Librarians and bookstores also contribute their support. In May 2011, eight students from our own MFA program in creative writing produced Out of Silence, a staged reading of rights works from the Afghan Women's Writing Project. It was the first performance of its kind at an American university. A growing coalition of American and Afghan women writers has embarked upon a bold journey, building a great bridge of language and educational opportunity upheld by collective heroism and the miraculous global reach of social media. I like to believe that Ashton Goodman would be proud to be such a significant inaugural part of this journey. I like to believe that her keen sense of justice and active compassion still support this mission. And I like to believe that she continues to walk with us on the bridge joining brave women and in, from disparate worlds. I want to write, says Iman. I want to write about my dreams, which never come true. My dreams. My power that has always been ignored. My voice, which is never heard by this deaf universe. My rights, which have never been counted. My life decisions, which are always made by others. Oh, my destiny, give me an answer. What am I for in this universe? What does it mean to be an Afghan woman? Hmm, I know you can't provide me with an elegant answer, so just give me the pen, the hidden pen, so that I can write. That is all I am asking for. I promise I will take revenge, but not like men, by gun and sword and aggression. Instead, I will write. I will write even if I am warned not to touch a pen or a paper. I know one thing, that they can't see that hidden pen with their blind eyes, no matter how strong their vision. My eyes will read my environment. My brain will save the details. And I will write with a hidden pen on the chambers of my heart so that when I am caught and executed, perhaps in Ghazi Stadium, like other innocent Afghan women, people can read my poems on the reddish stream of my blood. I will start writing with a hidden pen, and I know this will lead to a day when girls of this land will be able to write with chalk on the chalkboards 
of the school or with markers on the whiteboards at the universities, and one day they will make their voices heard, and then the hidden pen will be remembered forever. Tabasam was a young woman who did not know how old she was, only that she was older than 20. Living at home in a Taliban-held province, she wanted to work, she wanted to go to school, but she'd been afraid ever since her aunt, working as a nurse, had been killed by the Taliban. In the spring of 2011, Tabasam, along with her father, was killed in a suicide bomb attack. Here's the last poem she wrote. I wish I wrote my destiny with silver colors of happiness that shined in my life. If I wrote my destiny, there would be no violence, no wars, no fights or conflicts. I wish I wrote my destiny. I'd have no grief in my heart. I would never be a sad human or a piece of gold hidden in the river. I would be happy and free.